In the Fallout universe, northern Appalachia is a strangely alien landscape. Dead trees rise above glowing orange rivers that cut across the powdery white landscape. When first encountering this site, one might assume that the area is in a state of perpetual winter, but sadly, this powder isn't snow. Instead, it's a thick layer of particulate pollution that serves as one of the primary reasons that this region became known as the Toxic Valley. I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of the site responsible for much of this ecological destruction, Grafton Steel. In the mid to late 2070s, the war between China and the United States raged from the icy battlefields of Anchorage, the steaming tropical isles in the Pacific, to the searing Gobi Desert. This war between two superpowers ate through vast quantities of resources, including massive amounts of steel. At the northern end of Appalachia, the crucibles of Grafton Steel were responsible for a huge amount of this versatile metal. With so much required to manufacture the ships, tanks, guns, ammunition, and power armor that kept the fight going, the mill was forced to operate above normal capacity to keep up. The plant's owner, Arthur Wood, was doing what he could to make that happen, and the United States government backed him up with the Wartime Workers Act. The Wartime Workers Act lengthened the work week to 12 hours a day, 6 days a week. While all this overtime might have seemed a boon to the workers struggling financially, as many were in Appalachia, only the 11th and 12th hours of the day were paid the usual overtime rate of time and a half. Along with this, while the 672 schedule might have been arduous but bearable in an office environment, it was torturous for these laborers working in physically demanding jobs in hot, poorly ventilated conditions. As these workers grew sick and exhausted, they knew that taking a sick day wasn't a viable option, as sick pay had been revoked, and a doctor's note was required to return. Though many of these workers might have considered unionization or striking for better conditions, the Wartime Workers Act also made these actions that slowed labor acts of treason. Alongside the Wartime Workers Act, safety precautions were practically ignored, and environmental regulations went unenforced. The smokestacks belched out smoke day and night. Liquid waste poured directly into Grafton Lake. Inside the plant, many workers were suffering injuries or dying in accidents. Sometime before 2077, an exhausted laborer named Billy Angler fell from a catwalk into a molten vat of steel. His death would soon lead to an act of industrial sabotage that took Grafton Steel to new heights in ecological destruction. Before his untimely death, Billy Angler worked at Grafton Steel with his brother Darius Angler. Employed as a chemist, Darius had resigned from the company as a form of protest against the worsening safety record. He had attempted to get Billy to leave as well, but Billy had needed the paycheck more than Darius. When Billy fell into that vat of molten steel, leaving no remains to bury, Darius swore vengeance on his former employer. He concocted a plan that required the formulation of a chemical that would corrupt the mill's equipment, and he set about its synthesis. Over the course of this process, he began to suspect that Grafton Steel was after him. Whether this paranoia was the effect of a pre-existing mental condition, or some sort of outgrowth of the grief he felt at the loss of his brother, or perhaps both, he decided that he needed to change his base of operations. To that end, Darius Engler moved to a cabin in the woods. We don't know specifically where this cabin was located, but we do know that in his paranoia, he killed a woman who was out hiking nearby. Not long after this, he started setting traps on his property. Not for people, but for the foxes and raccoons that he suspected were being used to spy on him. Eventually, he moved again. This time to Willard Corporate Housing, a trailer park for the employees of Wavy Willard's Water Park. Whether he feared his position had again been compromised, or if he had run out of cash and needed some temporary employment, we don't know. But soon after, his formula was ready. The time for vengeance came in late 2076 to early 2077. Darius snuck into the plant and deployed his chemical weapon into the blast furnace. As for what became of him after this point, we don't know. But soon after, the smokestacks began to blow fine white ash. As time went on, more and more of this toxic ash blew out of the stacks, falling on the surrounding valley. Inside the plant, worker accidents were becoming more and more prevalent. Outside the plant, children were dying of exposure to the polluted water and the toxic ash. One of the company employees and the plant owner's brother-in-law, Otis Pike, was appalled by the company's inaction on both fronts. Though he tried to get Arthur Wood to do something about these problems, it became clear that he was blinded by avarice. On May 14, 2077, he leaked information about his company's malfeasance to the press. As these leaked documents made their way through the system, the problem of the ash was becoming more acute. 
On June 12th, Abigail Poole, the Speaker of the House, sent Governor Evans an email telling him to halt the operation of Grafton Steel. She suspected this ash would destroy the tourism industry and lead to more worker riots. Whether or not the governor had a hand in it, Grafton Steel finally brought in a consultant, Donna Mason, to figure out what could be done about the ash. Miss Mason determined that whatever had caused the corruption to the plant's equipment, it had now spread to every part of the mill. While they might have simply been able to clean out the furnace if they'd shut down when the ash first appeared, that was no longer an option. Simply put, her verdict was this. So long as the plant was in operation, it would blow more toxic ash across the valley. The company's response to this was indifference. They figured that the workers had sabotaged the mill and they would have to deal with the consequences. On June 28, 2077, the leaked information was finally printed and all hell broke loose in the valley. Otis was delighted to see the media, workers, and locals protesting around Grafton Steel. They barricaded the roads, blocking shipments to and from the mill. Four days later, the government sent in the National Guard, clearing the roads and restoring the plant to operation. The ash started flying once more. The governor received a thank you letter from the President of the United States and the Department of Defense, along with an invitation to share his methods with other political and industrial leaders. Demoralized but undeterred, Otis Pike decided to take down the company from within. Sabotage began to occur across the facility as employees destroyed robots and other equipment. While this might have felt good, these actions actually drove quicker adoption of robots to replace human workers. HR manager Stacy Tibbetts believed that the cause of the bad morale and the sabotage was Otis Pike badmouthing the company. After an investigation proved her right, on August 14th, she fired Otis Pike and let her boss know that he could have his brother-in-law hanged for treason if he wanted to press the issue. Desperate to stop the deaths and with no other obvious recourse left to him, Otis Pike resolved to do anything that he could to stop his brother-in-law's reckless actions. He finally settled on the plan of kidnapping his nephew, Freddie Wood. Before this plan could be executed, Otis Pike knew that he would have to remove his nephew's GPS-linked Kid Secure bracelet. To that end, he contacted the company and received a deactivation override. With this in hand, on October 17th, 2077, Otis Pike arrived at Wavy Willard's Water Park. Freddie Wood was there celebrating his seventh birthday when his uncle appeared behind him, detached his bracelet, and carried him off. Though a manhunt would ensue, Otis Pike had prepared for this, and he brought Freddie to a place that no one would find him, Grafton Dam. Having previously learned that the site was fully automated, Otis brought his nephew inside with no intention of harming him. This kidnapping unfortunately proved to be a fruitless avenue, as on October 20th, Arthur Wood left a note at a drop site for Otis, telling him that he could keep Freddy. He explained that he was willing to give up his own son to save the country from the commies. By this point, Freddy was bored and he wanted to go home. A pioneer scout, he used his knowledge of knots to trap his uncle, leaving Otis hanging upside down as he headed home. He arrived as the bombs were falling, and he was whisked off to a vault by waiting vault tech representatives that had been paid by his father to save his life. At Grafton Dam, Otis Pike either died hanging upside down or from falling on his head as he attempted to escape. Sometime after the nuclear winter thawed and before the post-war society collapsed, Grafton Steel served as the site of a sniper battle, with one sniper at the Pioneer Scout Camp and one sniper at Grafton Steel. Both of these snipers were there to take each other out, on the orders of the same unknown third party. Sometime after the scorching, Grafton Steel became home to a group of super mutants. Former dwellers of Vault 76 who choose to assist the raiders of the crater must enter the Grafton Steel underground in order to rescue Ra Ra, ensuring the assistance of Gale and Ra Ra for the raid on Vault 79. Today, the Grafton Steel Yard can be seized by those who desire the material production of its nodes and access to the site's vertibot. Alright, I think that should just about do it for what I could find on Grafton Steel, but I've got a few things I want to note before closing things out. First, for those of you who watched my previous video that covered this topic, Darius Angler and the Making of the Toxic Valley, let me note the elephant in the room. This video effectively rewrites the timeline of events of that story. The reason for this is that it uses more than just Darius Angler's personal story as source material. His six manifesto pages and hollow tapes conclude with him saying that with everyone focused on the air raid sirens and the ground shaking, that no one's going to notice his action. I originally took this as a factual representation of events and assumed that he deployed his sabotage on October 23rd, 2077 as the bombs were coming down across the country. 
I published that first video September 26th, 2019. In the two and a half years hence, I've gotten a much deeper understanding of the lore, and part of that has included three additional sources that don't add up with the original narrative. These three are, a. The email from Abigail Poole to Governor Evans regarding the ash falling in the valley in June 2077. B. The September 2077 terminal entry at Sugar Grove talking about the strikes and powder sabotage at Grafton Steel. And C. The holotape at Grafton Steel called Repair Plan that details an inspection of the systems of the mill because it is spewing ash. To work these three into the narrative, I came to the conclusion that Darius Angler was wrong when he thought the bombs were coming down. I've taken it to be the case that whatever the mental condition was that was causing his severe paranoia, it also gave him some sort of delusion when he was avenging his brother. I don't know how else to combine his account of his actions with external entries that clearly refer to the ash months before the bombs. The second note that I have is that I don't know specifically when Billy Angler died, when Darius Angler began to work on his revenge, or even exactly when he completed it. There are no dates on any of Darius Angler's manifestos, especially if I take his final tape to have been created in a delusional state. I decided to put the sabotage near the end of 2076 and the start of 2077 because it's in February 2077 that Otis Pike first notes that local kids are dying. Third, I tried to think of any explanation I could come up with for what this white powder is that comes blasting out of Grafton Steel. And here's what I've got. I believe that somehow Darius Angler created a formula that fundamentally changed the mill's equipment so that the vast majority of its gaseous exhaust is converted to solid waste. While originally I considered that this could have meant that the plant could be run much more cleanly than before, without having to use a filtering medium to extract the worst of the pollution, there are two problems with this assumption. They would have to capture the powder rather than simply let it float away, which they were unwilling to do. And the repair plan holotape mentions they would have to keep making near constant repairs as the sabotage is corrosive to the system. Anyway, that's what I think his formula did to cause the mill to make this toxic white ash. Although it's a different set of circumstances entirely, I recommend that you check out what gallium does to aluminum if you want to see how a metal can be corrupted. Fourth, this content is an excellent warning against the military industrial complex. Because Grafton Steel supports the war effort, it's given governmental authority to operate no matter the cost to its workers and to the surrounding environment. Attempting to stop the company's reckless behavior is grounds for a treason charge and the execution befitting traitors. HR manager Stacy Tibbetts even talks about using conscription to bring workers into the mill. Fifth, the events at Grafton Steel drew the eye of Raleigh Clay, who sent people to watch the mill and look for opportunities for sabotage. Sixth, though Grafton Steel was polluting the water of Grafton Lake, I think the source of the orange glow is some sort of fluid coming off the crashed space station, which I believe crashed down shortly after the bombs. Seventh, there were a few pieces of lore added to Grafton Steel with the Wastelanders update that I didn't talk about, including the fact that Grafton Steel was given grants by the federal government to work on new versions of power armor, steel, and furnace equipment. Along with this, there was an infiltrator of unknown origin that perished while attempting to move through the ductwork. There's also a full suggestion box terminal that includes employees arguing about petty personal problems. I mention these items here because they did happen at Grafton Steel, but the real point of this video was to discuss the terrible conditions at Grafton Steel and how they led to the sabotage by Darius Angler, the kidnapping of Freddie Wood, and the creation of the Toxic Valley. It was hard for me to consider where to fit in the fact that the employees were arguing over which version of Nuka-Cola they wanted to be in the break room. Eighth, regarding Darius Angler's sabotage, I now hold the company to be even more responsible for the damage to the environment than I did before. Yes, Darius Angler is responsible for the attack on the mill, and his formula created the white ash. But it's the company that chose to keep operating even once they knew they had a problem. I used to blame Arthur Wood for the water pollution and Darius Angler for the ash, but I now view Darius and Arthur as sharing 50% of the blame for the ash each. Darius initiated it. Arthur perpetuated it. Lastly, I'm hoping at some point we get to meet Freddie Wood, who is supposed to have been placed in a vault. Assuming he made it into a non-experimental vault, he may well still be alive and as of 2104, approximately 34 years old. Alright, I think that's enough on the story of Grafton Steel. If you want to receive notifications when I launch these lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. 
I've started streaming on Twitch and or YouTube. I'm working on a schedule still, but it's looking like most Saturday afternoons and maybe an hour or two on the evenings of Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, but we'll see. If you're interested, come by and check it out. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Jill AWS, and Dark Malcontent of Metaverse Studios for their support. This has been the Resolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.